Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. While you're here, please make sure to like and subscribe and hit the red button. If you're listening to this on podcast, please make sure to leave me a review. This allows my content to get in front of more people. My name is Judy Cho, and I am board certified in holistic nutrition. I focus on root cause healing, and oftentimes that starts with using the Carnivore Cures meat only elimination diet. Today, I'm excited to share with our community the work of Dr. Susan Thompson. Dr. Susan Thompson is not meat based, but she has so much expertise in brain and food addiction. She is an expert on how food addiction is real. Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson is an adjunct associate professor of brain and cognitive sciences at the University of Rochester, and she's an expert in the psychology of eating. She is a New York Times bestseller with her book, Brightline Eating, and she is the president of the Institute for Sustainable Weight Loss and the founder and CEO of Brightline Eating solutions. I loved interviewing Dr. Susan Thompson about food addiction because not only is she an expert and a professor on this entire field, but she struggled with her own addictions. It's pretty fascinating what she's been addicted to and how she struggled and how she's overcome a lot of this. What I really want you to get out of this interview is that it doesn't matter who you are. Everyone can be susceptible to food addiction. Sure, genes matter and you may be more susceptible with genetics, but for some people, it may be the one last lever you need to get to root cause healing. Dr. Susan Thompson has a quick 10 questionnaire that can show you if you have susceptibilities to food addiction. I highly recommend checking it out and let's get right into this interview. Hi, Dr. Susan Thompson. Thank you so much for joining me. Your work is amazing. I'm really excited to have my audience and community learn more about you. If you can introduce yourself for the people that are listening and watching. Oh, hi, Judy. It's great to be here. Um, yeah. Hey, everyone. I'm Susan Pierce Thompson and I founded Bright Lion Eating about seven years ago, and I'm excited to be here with you today. Okay. And do you want to share a little bit about your background and how you got into the like psychology of eating that's, you know, and how you're an expert in that area? Yeah, totally. I mean, goodness, it really came from my personal journey. Um, my take on eating and food is really from an addiction science standpoint. Um, and I do have uh, degrees in that. So my PhD is in brain and cognitive sciences from the University of Rochester. And um, I did undergrad at UC Berkeley. I know you did too. Uh, so go Bears. Um, but my undergrad is in cognitive science from UC Berkeley. Um, and I did a postdoc in Sydney, Australia in psychology um, and was a psychology professor for 16 years before. And then I started trying to write this book called Bright Line Eating and Bright Line Eating took off. And I ended up giving back tenure and just doing Bright Line Eating full time. But the, the way I got into this was that I have a very addictable brain and I discovered that by accident. Um, I was addicted to cigarettes really young and I started doing drugs at the age of 14 recreationally, but I got really hooked and the drugs I was doing got uh, fiercer and fiercer. Uh, so from, you know, just sort of the usual party drugs, alcohol, pot, and some occasional psychedelics into crystal meth and then cocaine and then crack cocaine. I dropped out of high school. I was prostituting to get enough money to support a very vicious crack cocaine habit. And that led me to getting clean and sober, uh, mercifully by a lot of grace when I was 20, but my addiction hopscotch right over to food. So, um, I put on a lot of weight after I got clean and I found food addiction to be harder to kick than crack cocaine addiction by a lot, like not even by a little, by a lot. And I spent the next many, many years battling my food addiction and my weight problem. And really at that point, I'd already gone back to school, you know, community college, then transferred to UC Berkeley and then, you know, done really well academically. I spoke at the graduation um, in 1997 when I graduated. So I could, I was doing well in life and I ran a marathon. I was, I could put, do pretty much anything I put my mind to, but I couldn't, I couldn't tackle the food addiction piece. I was still binging. I was still gaining weight. I was still obsessed by thoughts of what I'd eaten or not eaten or whether I I was on my plan or off my plan and trying exercise regimens and just all kinds of stuff. I, I just couldn't tackle it. So even 
with trying a lot of the 12 step approaches that uh, had worked for me with drugs and alcohol. So that's how I came to this. I did finally lose my excess weight. I, I hit obese. Uh, I, I hit the obese marker on the BMI chart before I even knew it. But looking back, mm -hmm. I think I was obese around the age of 25 or 26. I was obese. And um, I did lose my excess weight when I was 28. Um, and I've been a size four, you know, comfortably that's sort of my right size body. I'm, I'm petite naturally. And, uh, yeah. So now for 18 years, I've been in my right size body. So that is rare for someone who's right. obese. So I come at it from, from just a lot of suffering is what I would say, like a lot of addiction and a lot of suffering. And then just getting really curious, like, geez, why can a brain like mine go so far off the rails? Like, how does that happen? And what's the deal with food addiction? So that is kind of my story. What's fascinating is um, I saw a lot of studies with rodents that talk about food addiction. You know, these rats are pulling on sugar versus cocaine. And whenever I bring up those examples, a lot of people will say, you've never been addicted to drugs. And so you don't know the <laughs> level of addiction and, but I know food addiction and how much I struggled with that. And so when they say that, I mean, sure, we have the rodent studies, but then I kind of get lost of, well, I, they're right. I've never been addicted to drugs. So I don't know the level of despair, but I do know with food, but since you have been struggling with both, both, and then you said the food is harder. Can you talk a little bit about why it may be harder, you know, from your yeah. own experience and then from the evidence based yeah. information. Yeah, totally. I go into this a lot in my latest book called Resume because there I found seven unique, powerful reasons why food is the hardest addiction to kick. And I don't know if I can rattle off all seven off the top of my head, but some of them, a lot of them have to do with the food environment, right? Like I got clean off crack cocaine and there was a whole world for me to go back to where no one was suggesting that I grab a pipe and smoke some crack. There were not billboards about mm -hmm. it. There wasn't a multi-trillion dollar industry pushing it in my face. You know, there are drug dealers and stuff, but because of the way our society is set up, it's covert, right? Where food addiction is pushed and pushed hard. And it's also not still treated as an addiction in mainstream society. So you try to say no thank you to pumpkin pie on Thanksgiving, you get a lot of blowback. Whereas I've been clean and sober now for 27 years, and I say no thank you to champagne on New Year's Eve, I say I don't drink, right? And people trip over themselves to get me some sparkling water, right? right? But not so when I tell people I don't eat sugar or flour. And those that those are pretty much what I say. The, it's sort of code word for like processed foods, right? Sugar and flour, like just don't eat them. But so there's a lot of social pressure. There's a whole food industry pushing it on us. There's, you know, another thing that makes it harder is the level of temporal and locational cues for food. It's way higher than uh, heroin or crack. So what I mean is when and where would you use, which means like when you're moving through your day, when are you triggered? When are, when are, you know, so someone who's quit smoking would relate to this because every time you walk out of a movie theater or every time you walk out of a restaurant, you want to light up a cigarette, right? That's the power of a temporal or a locational cue. For food, the cues are now everywhere. Our society has become insane. You can go to a business meeting at 10 in the morning and they're passing around Danish and bagels and, you know, there's a pot of coffee with packets of sugar and dollops of cream for you to put in there. And so, you know, you go to a, in, into a movie theater and the first thing you have to do is pass a snack bar with the smell of popcorn, you know, knocking you over the head. You can't go anywhere without being walloped by those cues. And really, there's almost no way to socialize without experiencing the pressure to eat and not just not just eat, but overeat and eat addictive foods. It's not like you go to a social mixer and someone was is saying, you know, would you like an apple? You know, nobody's saying that, right? It's like, here's some potato chips, right? Here's some soda pop. Here's Here's, you know, you're just having uh, addictive foods pushed on you all the time. So, you know, and then there's some neurological reasons as well. Um, food, interestingly, is the only addiction that counts as both a substance addiction and a process or behavioral addiction. So just like gambling or watching internet pornography, the process of eating is 
rich and varied and Q-laden enough, it releases enough endogenous chemicals that just eating can be addictive, the process of eating. So once you're hooked on processed foods, you can actually become addicted to just overeating anything. You know, I know people who used to stand in the kitchen and because they were so calorie conscious, they would eat whole heads of iceberg lettuce and whole boxes of button mushrooms dipped in mustard. And they would binge on that and they would, you know, binge their brains out on a hundred calories or something ridiculous. It sounds silly. I'm sure they started with sugar and flour, but eating itself can become addictive. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons, but uh, food is the hardest. I love that you brought up the example of people just binging off of vegetables and like the most benign, supposedly healthy foods, because I'll get in. So in our community, there's a lot of people that do a meat only elimination diet. So think of paleo or autoimmune paleo, and then take it to the nth degree with removing all vegetables because of the possible plant-based toxins. And so when they do that, a lot of the people that had food addictions that never realized they had food addictions, now they no longer have that solace of, you know, just comforting with foods. But there are some people that say they still struggle even in the, like they'll start overeating cheese or overeating bacon or pork rinds. And that's when they realize maybe I do have something. And then there's people that have never struggled with food addictions that are, that will say no one will binge off of vegetables, but I I know people that can, and you just brought up a perfect example. I used to binge off of like large salads and I would just use mustard to fill my stomach up, to feel that stomach stretch receptor to make myself feel full, but it would still require, um, still cause a binge by the end of the evening because I wasn't satiating myself as well. So yeah, once yeah, we totally. identify that about us, like how do we start going about healing ourselves? Yeah, great. Well, the, the identification is the first piece and it's so interesting. I, you're, you're being very open about having had a history of food addiction yourself. I have a quiz, foodaddictionquiz.com that people can take. It's five questions. It's super simple and it gives you a score from one to 10. It sounds like you might be a 10. I'm definitely a 10. And it just sort of asks you about like, you know, after eating, first of all, it asks you to think back to the worst period of your eating, like not just a day, but like a stretch of time, you know, weeks or months where your eating was absolutely at its worst. And the reason you need to do that is that once those fiber tracks are laid down in the brain, they never go away. It's sort of like a a water that's formed a river, riverbed, and we can get you healed. We can you know, uh, get you free from the overt symptoms where you're like me, you're in a right size body, you, you know, eat normally to all intents and purposes, you know, for anyone looking from the outside, you're eating your breakfast, lunch and dinner, it all looks fine. But the problem is that those dry riverbeds are laying, laying in wait. And that's the way the brain works is that if you let that water trickle down that pathway again in the brain and the water in the brain is neural energy. It's electricity. You're eligible to being right back where you started very quickly. And this is the neural correlate of once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of uh, lines of literature and neuroscience that speak to this, that, you know, kids who get exposed to, you know, French for the first three years of their life, and then move to China and live the rest of their life in China. If they try to learn French at the age of 80, they'll pick it up like that, no accent, and be very fast at it. So those those fiber tracks are still there in your brain. So think back to your worst eating and then at, answer questions like during that stretch of time, when you ate a moderate amount of food, were you satisfied or not really satisfied, right? Or how much of your time were you spending thinking about your food, your weight, your diet, your exercise, all that stuff. Sometimes when you started to eat, would you feel like you would lose control over how much you ate? Um, did you ever binge? Those are the sorts of questions that that are asked. So foodaddictionquiz.com. And once you know your score on a scale from one to 10, it's sort of like, you know, if you're a one through four, that's pretty low. And you don't have enough food addiction on board to really worry about, you know, and you're really lucky in this environment. And it's genetic. Um, You can look through your family tree. And if you don't have a lot of alcoholics and two pack a day smokers, and you know, so forth, you're 
you know, you're lucky and um, it is slightly environmental as well. So you can take two people who don't have addictive tendencies, they can have kids. And then if the kids are given up for adoption and then bounced around foster homes, their whole upbringing, uh, some percentage of them will end up with addictive tendencies. So it's largely genetic, somewhat environmental as well. And yeah, once you know that you have it, then you can start to think about your food from the perspective of addiction. And we know a fair bit about addiction, right? Especially if it's a substance addiction, you might want to look at abstinence. You know, alcoholics sometimes recover drinking occasionally, mostly quitting drinking is the smarter thing to do. I don't know that many three pack a day smokers, former three pack a day smokers that allow themselves a cigarette at a concert, right? Like probably not that wise, probably you need to be a non smoker, right? So that's bright line eating, you know, you have a bright line for the addictive foods, sugar, flour, and sometimes people have additional bright lines for additional foods that are problematic for them. But yeah, like, uh, and it turns out to be freeing. It's like, oh, wow, it's actually way easier just to never start down the path of eating cookies at all. It's just way easier. I I love all of what you talked about. So just a little bit of my history is that I was in um, those intensive outpatient cares for eating disorders. And so I was plant-based at that time. And they were like, okay, we totally respect that you don't eat meat. And someone was low carb there. And they're like, no, you can't have, you cannot uh, remove sugar and white flour from your diet as that's an eating disorder. And so that was sort of the rules, but again, you could remove meats. And so the way that the dietitian said you would be healed is if you can tolerate, or if you can accept eating like a piece of cupcake after the meal and not get triggered with the thoughts in your head, the desire to binge any of those thoughts, and that's how you're healed. And so for so long, I would try to basically live in this moderator world when I was never wired that way. You know, I noticed I had those really extreme, um, actions in my whole life. And then when I learned, I think it was from, uh, Gretchen Rubin who talked about abstainers versus moderators. And I realized, yes. oh my gosh, it, I can be an abstainer and acknowledge that about myself instead of forcing myself to be a moderator when I'm not that way. And learning yeah. that has been so freeing and, and then removing, like you said, I think this is what bright line eating does is removing certain foods and saying it's not food. And then once you do that, it actually right. becomes a lot more freeing. So can totally. you talk a little bit about, um, it sounds like there's a little bit of abstaining from foods that are not necessarily ideal for you, but if you could talk a little bit about bright line eating. Yeah, sure. I love that. The, the abstainers and moderators, I'm a big fan of that concept. And we get a lot of moderators in bright line eating who just kind of mm -hmm. gradually uh, acclimate to it. Bright line eating is a plan that started seven years ago. So 2014. And um, the four bright lines are sugar, flour, meals and quantities. Mm. So the first two bright lines, sugar and flour address the substance addiction, right? And the idea is, it's so funny that that eating disorder clinic made you eat cup. And that's really common made you eat cupcakes and sometimes multiple times a day, right? Yes. You got to have, you know, a little bit of candy here, a little bit of cupcake. And, and they would consider the people that would refuse to be severely eating disorder yes. and they would lose privileges and so forth. It's like, no, you got to eat your cupcake. It's so funny. I work with an amazing PhD eating disorder expert named Dr. Joy Jacobs. And she describes working in those types of settings and noticing that her patients after they were forced to eat the, the piece of cupcake, right. Would, would go off the rails. They would binge. Yeah. And she just eventually from watching her clients realized maybe this isn't wise or reasonable. Maybe these people can't eat these foods in right. moderation. They would do so much better when they wouldn't eat those foods. So um, yeah, sugar and flour handle the substance addiction. And then the last two bright lines, and let me just say by sugar, what do I mean? I mean, anything added to your food to make it sweeter. So I mean, all sweeteners, and that includes artificial sweeteners, mm -hmm. and it includes stevia and truvia, they, um, they trigger the uh, sweet taste buds on the tongue, which have direct connections to the addiction, addictive centers of the brain. So while it is true that stevia doesn't trigger the glucose insulin mechanisms, it gets to the addictive centers way before that anyway. So, um, and take it as someone who has, you know, tried the packets of stevia in my tea and then followed by more packets of stevia, followed by 10 packets of stevia straight right. down the gullet, followed by the cupcakes in the freezer. So yeah, it, 
So anyway, all sweeteners, including honey, maple syrup, et cetera, and no dried fruit or fruit juice, but whole fresh real fruit is actually fine. Okay. So apples, grapefruit, whatever, whole fresh real fruit. By flour, we mean flour made out of anything. So it's really not the plant that it comes from that's the issue. It's the refining and processing of it. So if you think about what makes something a drug, I often take people through the exercise of, you know, what is cocaine? What is heroin? What, how do they make drugs? Right. And then, you know, people say, well, heroin comes from, do you know, Judy, where heroin comes from? No, I don't. (laughs) It comes, it comes from poppy plants actually. Oh, wow. Which is why you can fail a drug test from eating poppy seed bagels. Oh, wow. But nobody is, Mm. you know, stealing their grandma's VCR to go buy more poppy seed bagels, right? Mm. It's not the poppies that make it addictive. It's actually only when you take the inner essence of that poppy plant and you extract it and then you refine and purify it down into either a fine brown powder or like a sludgy liquid, which is really interesting because there's a correlate there to the um, high fructose corn syrup, right? Processed in a very similar way. And uh, cocaine, cocaine comes from the coca leaf. Yeah. There are these bushes in the Andes mountains and hikers will pluck the leaves, put them in their cheek and chew on them. And it'll make the inside of the cheek a little bit numb. And it'll give you a little bit of a lift. Like, I don't know, the equivalent of drinking half a cup of caffeinated tea or something, but there's actually a published scientific paper that talks about how chewing coca leaves is not addictive, Mm. like physiologically not addictive. But if you take the inner essence of those coca leaves and you extract it, and then you refine and purify it down into a fine white powder, you've taken a harmless, non-addictive plant and you've turned it into a powerfully addictive drug. And so when I say no flower, I mean, no fair extracting a healthy, wholesome plant, extracting the inner essence, and then refining and purifying it down into a fine powder. That is the problem. So no flour made out of anything. So no flour, yeah. like even almond flour, you know how there's all these like Correct. cassava yes. flour, none of them. Yeah. Coconut flour, almond flour, none of them. Cause it's the flat, it's the, ex- it's the purifying gotcha. process. That's the issue. And then also asterisk, the thing about those flowers is what would you do with them? Because in bright line eating, we really focus on eating whole real mm-hmm. food, like unadulterated food, right? So what you're going to do with those things is you're going to coat something in it and then fry it, or you're going to bake something. Or, and it's like, no, we're not doing any of that. We're not doing any of that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you can eat brown rice, just eat, eat the brown rice, you know, but no brown rice flour. Now we're talking about a drug. So the last two bright lines are show, are uh, meals and quantities. So eating only meals, no grazing, no snacking, no free foods, no eating all the time. Um, in bright line eating, we usually start people on three meals a day, but but intermittent fasting is fine if you want to, you know, jitter with your meal times or whatever. That's really not the issue. The issue is not grazing or snacking all day long. Uh, get the gum out of your mouth. Get the mints out of your mouth. Just meals. And then quantities. So this is an interesting one. I recommend people use a digital food scale, but not for the reason you might think. Uh, I eat more food than most anybody I know. There is a lot of food to be eaten. And I want to make sure you're eating enough, especially of vegetables um, and not too much of, you know, other things, but the quantities are quite ample, but digital food scale. So you're not just going to pile on the blueberries, you're going to have six ounces of blueberries, that kind of thing. So the digital food scale is also very freeing for people who have gotten very hooked on quantities. Like you were talking about the eating to feel those stretch receptors expand. And there is definitely something about eating past a certain point of volume that triggers a binge for a lot of people. And the, the digital food scale kind of caps that off. So yeah, so those are the bright lines. I know it sounds really like a lot, right? It's not like, oh my gosh, I could never do that. But here's the thing. We start people on Bright Line Eating and we've now had over a hundred thousand people go through our programs and um, from every country on planet earth, just about. And we have research going on on the back end all the time. And we publish papers in the Journal of Nutrition and Weight Loss and other present at conferences and so forth. And what our research shows is that right away after people start Bright Line Eating, their hunger levels go down down, even while they're losing weight, their craving levels go down steadily till they have little to no cravings ever. And their peace and serenity with food goes up, 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 up. 
people don't get crazy on this plan, obsessing about the amounts and the meal times and all that. They get peaceful with their food. It becomes as much of a non-issue as brushing your teeth before bed. It's like I come down in the morning and I get out my bowl, I put it on my digital food scale and I'm weighing out my oatmeal before I even, you know, it's like, I don't think about it at all. It's like brushing my teeth. It's like, you know, my routine in the shower, it's just automatic. So anyway, that's, that's bright line eating. And we have the, I, I have never seen as an academic in this field, and I am still a professor at the University of Rochester. I have never seen weight loss results like ours. I can't, you can't find them anywhere. So uh, we, you know, in, on most programs, people lose weight at first. And then within a year to two years, almost all the pounds are regained. In bright line eating, two years out, we just published the study in the Journal of Nutrition and Weight Loss, two years out zero weight regained in a group of lots of people. And not that no one regained weight, but for anyone who regained a pound, there was someone else who lost two more pounds. Sure. Um, So as a group, zero weight regained, as a matter of fact, double the initial weight loss by two years out and everybody maintaining it as as a group, as a cohort, the whole group maintaining it. So it's pretty stunning. It works. What are your thoughts about the macro? So In context, a lot of the people that start an elimination diet that remove a lot of, you know, the processed foods, but they also go to the extreme of removing some plants, you know, the foods that maybe have some gluten, things like that. And um, for some people, when they start reintroducing fruits, that triggers that desire for sweet foods. And then I guess some people do touch honey, but there are some people that don't touch honey, but they'll eat a plethora of fruits. And so that kind of becomes their trigger. And I don't know, since I didn't personally do that, but there are people then that I'll see eat like seven fruits in a day. So I don't know. Do you think that macros has an impact with the triggering of the brain? Yeah. So those, that could be a macro issue or it could be a fruit specific issue. It could be a sweetness issue. I know one person um, in all my years of, of teaching people, thousands of people to do what I teach people to do. I know one person who still years in will binge on fruit and you know, she's just, she's not even safe around apples, uh, you know, and, but it's exceedingly rare. And in bright line eating, you don't just eat as much fruit as you want come mealtime, you have a food plan that's sure. like a skeleton. So like I get a fruit at breakfast and a fruit at lunch. Okay. And it doesn't matter if I'm in the mood for fruit at dinner, I don't get a fruit at dinner, right? Some people would get a fruit at dinner, but that depends on their metabolism. It would okay. like fruit would be like the sixth thing you'd, you'd add to a dinner or whatever. Mm-hmm. If you don't need that much food to sustain your body size, you know, you don't get a fruit at dinner. I'm small, okay. so I don't get a fruit at dinner. So, you know, as much as I love fruit, and I feel like I probably could eat 10 fruits in a day, uh, I get two. So I eat two. And that's, again, the beauty of the digital food scale. It just caps it off when I'm done, you know, I get six ounces of blueberries, no more. Okay. So then other than the bright lines of the no sugar, the no flour, which I think makes a lot of sense because there's always these, you know, like keto is becoming a lot more popular. And so there's all these switcheroos of like, you know, the processed food to now being a ketified version and they're not yeah. necessarily much healthier. Totally. But, no. Yeah. But then no there's all, yeah. Stop it with the, yeah, totally. You process food and smush it all together and say, look, the macros fit. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but there's also these parameters within the diet that what I'm hearing from you with that weight. Yes, totally. So like, you know, uh, yes, exactly. So it would be, you know, you're going to eat some vegetables and you're not going to eat a vegetable smoothie. You're not going to eat, you know, a powder, you know, you're not going to eat vegetable crisp potato chips, <laughs> you know, whatever they went veggie sticks or whatever they've got now in a bag in the potato chip aisle. No, no, no. You're going to like go to the store and buy a carrot, you know, and like weigh out six ounces of vegetables. Okay. Yeah. How long after do you see the transition for, for example, like someone that's following a standard American diet for them to switch to this bright line way of eating? Is it a really difficult process for them to start eating that clean? You know, some people take to it really easily. I mean, within a couple of days, they're like, Oh, this is amazing. This is amazing. I think it depends on how eager someone is to to do it for whatever reason, whether they're excited to lose their weight, they're excited to just not be obsessed about food anymore. They're excited to have their food just clean and clear and handled. And, you know, so it, it varies. But in my experience, a very common experience from someone starting bright line eating is they're shocked at how easy it is after just a little bit, because the plan is like, it's sort of like categories that you just Mm -hmm. slot in. Like I said, for breakfast, I get a fruit. Right. And so I'm just, I'm just deciding, am I going to eat blueberries or strawberries or a banana or, you know, it just Mm -hmm. gets very easy to think. And then you go grocery shopping and you're like, 
okay, I need 14 fruits to make it through the week, right? So this bag of apples has seven fruits and this bunch of banana has four bananas and I'm grabbing, you know, three oranges and I'm out the door, you know, easy. During the pandemic, um, I noticed as soon as it hit, people, you know, were scared. And so that that rush of cortisol, I think everyone, like you said, the neural pathways that are already within your system, I noticed that everyone started turning back to food because, hey, I need a comfort somehow. When people do bright line eating, do they just work through that on their own? Do they need some type of therapy support? I mean, how do we stop turning to food for comfort? And I know a lot of people don't think they do. I think your quiz will be probably be the ideal way to figure that out for themselves. But how do we start healing our real relationship with food that has nothing to do with hunger? Yeah, totally. Great question. You know, it was so interesting during Bright Line Eating. I saw a mix in our community. I saw a lot of people so grateful for Bright Line Eating because they were not turning to food. As a matter of fact, they were using their food, their Bright Line Eating program as the scaffolding of, of their sanity. Mm. Like when all else fails, oh, it's time to weigh lunch, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, seriously, it provides such structure right. and sanity to the day. And people were leaning into their lines. That's what we call it. They were leaning into their lines. And what happens when you do bright line eating, we focus on the inner work a lot. It is not just a food plan. We have very structured programs in our membership for doing the inner work. And as a matter of fact, we use uh, a psychological approach called IFS or internal family systems, where you look at the parts of yourself and how they're reacting to any particular situation, or maybe you're not having a part react to a situation, maybe you're just in your clean, clear, highest authentic self, right? Which everybody's got an authentic self. And when you're calm and clear and compassionate and curious, that's your authentic self. So in, in COVID times, I saw a lot of people go bajiggity with their food and go off the rails and, oh my gosh, I'm beating my way back again. But that was not the dominant narrative. I saw more people so grateful for bright line eating and leaning into their lines. And we launched a course at that time called bright line grit, mm. uh, in our membership. And we took people through a course on staying calm and bright through crisis. And that course is still available in our membership for anyone who's going through any crisis, whether it's right. divorce or, you know, the unexpected death of someone really close or being laid off unexpectedly or any sort of crisis, because it is a thing to learn how not to turn to food. It's for most of us, it was our number one crutch, our number right. one go-to response reaction to life was to eat, right? Or eat first, and then I'll figure out what I'm gonna do, right? Let me, let me go get something to eat. Right. And then, you know, I'll get on my computer, I'll start to, you know, I'll make a couple of phone calls, we'll figure out what we're going to do about this. But uh, first, we'll eat, right? And it the, the neat thing about life is it shows up one, one day at a time. And when you when you do bright line eating, you get only one day's worth of life to handle without eating addictively. And you get to sort of learn new coping skills and new patterns of behavior gradually. And over time, you get very, very strong at not turning to food. I love that. Um, when I first started eating more of a ketogenic diet, that little bit of I guess the, although I was using a lot of sweetener though, but the little grams of carbohydrates that I allowed myself on some days, it would be the veggies. And then some days it's like, well, the Snickers fit my macros. And, but that would always <laughs> cause me back to binge eventually. And so when I just cut out all um, foods other than meats for a while, uh, there was true healing. And then I had to focus on, well, why am I turning to food for comfort and for anger, for happiness, for everything. And when I did that hard work, it just really started and nourishing my body. Um, that's when true healing started happening. And so I think that's really, yeah. really powerful. What do you think about coffee and other stimulants that, you know, people say, well, that's a little bit of a stimulus as well. Yeah. Coffee is so interesting mm -hmm. and caffeine, you know, coffee, yeah, caffeine. caffeine, it's on its own spectrum is what I find. Cause you know, like I said, I guess 1.6 million people have joined the bright line eating email list since I started it. And over a hundred and something thousand people have tried our programs in one form or another. Um, and that's a lot of people, right? right? I've coached a lot of people over the last seven years. And that's on top of the clinical experience I had before that. All that to say, the caffeine spectrum, the coffee spectrum is totally separate in my experience, orthogonally separate 
for all the math geeks out there from the food addiction continuum. And what that means is that someone who's highly susceptible to food addiction may or may not find that caffeine impacts or influences their food journey. Like for me, I'm moderate on the caffeine scale or whatever, which means like I can have coffee or caffeine, um, but I'm moderate. I'm not low. So it'll often start to escalate, but over a long period of time, it doesn't ever send me into needing cream and sugar and breaking my bright lines like that. Like if I learned a long time ago, I have it black. Now, just to say back in the day, (laughs) when I would make my cup of coffee at the little station, this is way, way back in the day, people would always say, uh, would you like some coffee with that cream and sugar? Cause I think it was like eight, eight creams, 10 (laughs) sugars or something like that just stand there like open packet after packet after packet so I you know I was aiming for Haagen-Dazs coffee ice cream was that was what I was aiming for that was that was the template um so I know what it's like to say oh I could never drink coffee black but uh when it's the only option uh you acclimate really fast black coffee is an acquired taste but I'm I'm moderate and then other people are low on the scale so they can have on the caffeine scale so they can have black coffee and take it or leave it even Uh, God bless them. And then for other people, it's the most interesting thing, Judy, any taste of coffee, even the slightest, they're putting cream and sugar into it and they're off to the races. Then, then they, they, they follow it with a piece of pizza, right? They just cannot, they cannot have, it's the biggest trigger for them. So, you know, coffee does release dopamine and it does in that way. One would argue, hinder the brain's healing of the dopamine receptors that are sort of part and parcel of addiction in general. But again, it, in practical terms, it doesn't seem to be a problem for everybody. I feel like addictions are all different. I mean, some people become addicted to alcohol and some people don't, some people get addicted to food. So, and like you said, there's a lot more stimulus for food. So the, the propensity is higher. Um, and I think that makes a lot of sense. Like I can drink alcohol and I know I won't ever become an alcoholic one. My body just turns really red when I drink. And so I know I just don't feel as good as probably the average person that can drink alcohol. So for me, I can take a little bit of alcohol and I'm fine. I think I'm the same as you with caffeine, but uh, I don't, I remember, I don't remember the words you used, but it's true what you said that just because you're addicted to one thing doesn't mean that you're addicted to another thing, but I wanted to flesh that out a little bit or okay. put some meat on those bones, if you will. Um, so the way it works is that addictive susceptibility, like I said, is genetic. And if you're born with it, that does give you a susceptibility to all addictions at baseline. But that doesn't mean you're going to be addicted to all things. Like I'm as addictively susceptible as they come. I mean, God bless me, I am certifiable. I have worked the 12 steps in five different 12 step programs over 27 years. But shopping, I could take it or leave it. I can one click one thing on Amazon and I don't care. I go go to the mall. The lights give me a headache. I don't care. But that doesn't mean that I'm not eligible, right? If my husband and I got a divorce and I was going to the mall with some friends and I found like, oh, this outfit's really cute. And I was, we had a really good day and you got to have the experience of the behavior and then the reward, the the cue followed by the reinforcement where your brain goes, oh yeah, that'll do like that will do. And then you got to follow it again and another reward comes. And then you start to get wired up in that specific domain for that particular addiction. So I just wanted to say, but they're about a third of the population, believe it or not, they're not susceptible to any addiction. So when people say, oh, everybody's addicted to something, I say, no, they're not. A third of people are not addicted to anything. As a matter of fact, you know, they could, you could shoot them up with heroin every day and they wouldn't get addicted to it. People say that's not possible. Heroin's addictive. It's like, no, no, no. People are going home with, you know, massive opiate prescriptions after back surgery all the time. And how many of them become pill heads afterwards? Not that many actually. So, and there are these people who they, they don't even need a cup of coffee every day and they can have a cigarette at a concert and not want one the next day. So anyway, that's the deal with addictive susceptibility. That's so fascinating. Would you say then these people that are really able to not be, you know, susceptible to any type of addiction that they are generally the people that are really good moderators, um, that maybe they are normal, relatively normal in weight? I mean, do you think there's a certain type of persona? Yes and no. 
So yes, they are moderators in that they tend toward a midline in terms of like, they're not drawn toward behavioral excesses. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Are they likely to be a normal weight? Not necessarily Mm -hmm. at all. What's happened in our society is you don't have to eat addictively to be overweight, even to be massively overweight. And it turns out that propensity to gain weight is not related to food addiction susceptibility at all. They're completely different genes, the addictive genes and the weight gain genes. They're not the same at all. So you can be not eating addictively and just be going downstream with the standard American diet, just eating and find yourself to be obese lickety split. I have a a graph, a chart actually, um, Uh, a table is what it is. I have a table in my first book, Bright Line Eating, The Science of Living Happy, Thin and Free. And and it, it looks at the, it breaks down food addiction susceptibility, like on a scale from one to 10, right? by BMI status. And it's shocking, like 22% of people who are at a normal BMI, they're in a right size body right now, 22% of them test out as full blown food addicts. And of people, yeah, right? And of people who are not just obese, but extreme morbid obesity, right? Only 56% of them are high on the food addiction susceptibility scale. Now, almost none of them are low. Very few of them are low, but a lot of them are just moderate, right? And they're not binging their brains out. They're just eating a lot of food all the time, you know, (laughs) just like lots of people around them are doing. So you have a concept called the reframing concept. Does that have something to do with, uh, I guess, reframing the way we look at food. Um, Like, what is that Mm. all about? Yeah, the resume reframe. That's, um, that's for my third book. And the idea, Judy comes from one of the challenges with a bright line approach to food is that engenders a lot of perfectionism, right? And for a lot of us, that's what we're trying to get away from. And I think this is where the eating disorder world hates the idea of getting rid of uh, whole foods, you know, like whole whole categories of food altogether. I mean, I, you can't call sugar a food group, right? Like we've gone way too far when, you know, remember, remember what the food groups are. Sugar's not one of them, everybody. Um, uh, But it's, it's hard to have a bright line approach to food when you've got a really rigid food controller part of you that just wants to get it perfect and wants all the I's dotted and the T's crossed. And then the feeling is that once you cross that bright line at all, now it's all gone to pot it. It's called the what the hell effect, which it, I'm not trying to swear. I'm, I'm literally, that's the name of it in the psychological literature. The what the hell effect is I've eaten one piece of pizza. I might as well eat the whole right. pizza and then we'll start over on Monday. And it's a very established effect in the minds of chronic dieters. So the resume reframe is about how to get out of that trap where the reality is, and I'm just going to tell it straight as an addiction neuroscientist, mm-hmm. the reality is for most people, who have, I'm not saying everybody, but for most people who are high on the food addiction susceptibility scale, there will be no peace or long-term weight loss success uh, if you keep eating the addictive foods. So abstinence really is, for most addictions, abstinence is the way to go. And that's true for food addiction as well. But it takes a powerful reframe to get you out of the what the hell effect and to learn how to ebb and flow when life gets lifey. And Uh, that's not permission to go, you know, eat a pint of ice cream, just cause, you know, just cause life got lifey. No. Um, However, if you do find that you just ate something off your plan, how can you stay calm? How can you do, you know, do something adaptive and helpful as opposed to self-flagellating and create the downward shame spiral. So it's very nuanced. um, And for anyone who is hearing themselves in my words, I really recommend my third book resume because, and it's spelled R-E-Z-O-O-M, like resume, do it fast, resume. It's called resume the powerful reframe to end the crash and burn cycle of food addiction. Okay. Yeah. It came out in December. And in that you talk about reframing and you talk through the ways to, I guess, deal with the emotional side. It sounds like compared to the first one is the introduction. Okay. Yes, totally. The first one goes through the science of like, why can't people lose weight? Right. What is going on to create the whisper in your mind that tricks you into eating stuff that you know you don't want to be eating? Like, why do you feel like you've chosen that? And yet every sane part of you knows that it's not in your best interest to do it. Like, how do you get duped over and over again into falling for that? And it, it, it very much is, it's neuroscience. Your brain is hijacked and it's whispering to you in your own voice, convincing you that you just decided to have that pizza and wings and beer on a Friday night. You did not choose that. And I can explain why your brain tricked you like that. 
So it's very relieving for people like me and maybe other people listening who struggled with their weight their whole life. And it's like, I'm so, I'm so committed when I start a plan. And then why a couple months later has it all dissolved, right? The third, the second book is a cookbook, Mm -hmm. uh, which is amazing. It's really good. The recipes in it. And then the third book is it's got the reframe in it. And yes, it's got the psychology and in particular, the parts perspective that I was talking about. So that war between the food indulger and the food Mm -hmm. controller and how the food indulger is always trying to, you know, convince us to, you know, let it go and to just, you know, go indulge. And then the food controller, when it gets back in control is so rigid and perfectionistic and trying to line it all up just so, and, you know, and there's other parts to the caretaker part and the isolator part Mm -hmm. and the rebel part. That's like, you can't, you know, bright lines. You can't tell me I can't eat sugar. It's just going to make me want it more and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. That's so So. fascinating. I love it because I do see that in the wellness space. So people will go from like the standard American diet and then they say, I'm going to eat clean and get my diet right. And then they go to the extreme of, I can't eat this. I can't eat this type of preservative or this type of X, Y, Z. And it's just to the extreme. And, and I, sometimes I think, I think that level of stress on your body too, is probably not as ideal. Do you have any tips if you kind of seem to toggle from both of those? Is it um, other than following the bright line eating, is there some maybe tricks or tips or habitudes that you can start including to support that extreme thinking? Well, I mean, the first thing I would say is just, it's helpful even to learn that it's a part, Mm -hmm. right? That you have a food controller part that is, it's a manager, right? And the, the job of these managers there, it's trying to protect us. It's trying to get ahead of our pain. It's trying to line it up so, so tight and firm that it, that we're never going to feel the pain that we are just now trying to escape from, right? That the pain of, of whatever it is of being overweight, of having failed again, of, you know, and people who've struggled in this battle over and over again with their food, there's a lot of pain back there. And that, that food controller part, it's just trying to get ahead of that and finally get it right this time. And it does, it goes to an extreme. So when you recognize that that's not actually your highest self, you know, it's, it feels like your highest self. Cause it's, it's so convinced that part of us is so convinced that it's got our best interest at heart right. and it's going to make our life fabulous. Finally, right. We're going to get that weight off. We're going to get our health issues solved, but that's not the energy of the highest self. Remember the highest self is calm. It's clear. It's compassionate. It's curious. It's connected. It's courageous. That's, that's the highest self. So uh, it's helpful even just to realize now people who have a strong manager food controller part, they do really well in bright line eating, especially with the weight loss aspect. And then as they're succeeding, they can learn the, about these parts and they can start to learn the difference between a food controller energy and a sane choice. For example, if they've written down their food plan the night before, like I teach them to do in bright line eating, and they're going to have, you know, grilled chicken and chopped up onions and peppers for dinner. Right. But suddenly their two-year-old needs to go to urgent care for an ear infection, right? And they get home at eight o'clock. Well, I don't want you chopping up onions at eight o'clock, grab a bag of frozen vegetables and put them in the microwave, right? Like we're switching things to, to, you know, frozen spinach, come on, right? And that's a sane choice. So the food controller says, no, 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 we wrote down peppers and onions. We got to start slicing peppers and onions. And so there's so many opportunities. Again, it's this idea that life shows up one day at a time. There's so many opportunities to learn that balance point of, yes, you need to follow your plan. I'm not saying you got home from the doctor, it's time to eat a pint of ice cream. I'm saying it's time to switch your vegetable to something that doesn't take much prep because it's eight o'clock at night. And it's okay that you're changing your plan. Some, you know, life got lifey. So let's be reasonable about this. So we get to teach that food controller part, the time and the place to lighten it, lighten up, but it's got an important job to do for those of us who suffered with our food as much as some of us have. It's not actually what we want to do to just go the food indulger route and say, well, no rules, you know, just take it all off the rails, right? That's not helpful either. So it, it's a lifetime art, I think, getting the balance between those two and living mostly from the highest self. I love that. I wish that they would teach everything that sounds like is in your third book in those eating disorder facilities, because I think they're fueling, I mean, first of all, it's all processed food in those places, but they're fueling (sighs) the people in there that are so sick, malnourished in ways of food that are so 
will get their blood sugar spiking and the dopamine kicks constantly. And then having you sit there and try to like understand your feelings and learning how to accept it. And that's the way they teach you. And they have great group therapy and other things to figure out why you're turning to food, but at the core, their, their food intake is wrong. And if you don't listen and eat the cupcake, they lock you in a room <laughs> eventually and have you taken sure, which has soybean oil and all this processed oh, sugar. And I know totally. It's, it's horrible. 48 ingredients that you can't pronounce. Right. Like, totally. It's yeah, it is. It's terrible. It's terrible. And, you know, we're really, I mean, that type of treatment it, to me, it's like leeching, right? It's like, yeah. Oh, you're, you've got a flu. So I'm going to put leeches on you. So they'll suck out the, the bad <laughs> stuff in your blood. Right. It's like, we are that, that type of approach is so far from even what the science shows now yes. as a needed necessary approach to eating disorders. A friend of mine just started a treatment house, a treatment center for people with uh, food addiction and potentially eating disorders as well. Mm. They're not the same, by the way, right. uh, food right. addiction is not an eating disorder. The Venn diagrams overlap by about half. So there are plenty of people with both. And I certainly was one of them. I had food addiction for sure. And then also at various times, binge eating disorder and bulimia. But a friend of mine just started a treatment house because there aren't enough facilities like that, that really understand the science of this stuff. Uh, We know a lot now about how food affects the brain and the, the history of the eating disorders treatment world is that, um, you know, anorexia and bulimia were diagnosed in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know much about addiction back then from a neuroscience Mm -hmm. perspective. And, you know, I think I'm just imagining this, but I'm guessing that they looked around and said, well, what does normal eating look like, right? Eating all things calmly in moderation, right? Not worrying about it too much. So let's teach people to do that, right? And the sort of mantra became no food rules. We got to disabuse people of their food rules. These people with anorexia and bulimia would come in holding so tightly to the long list of food rules that they'd concocted in their heads. I'm not going to eat more than 300 calories and I'm never going to eat this long list of foods and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, 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 you're going to let go of all those food rules. Well, the problem is fast forward, you know, 50 years, 50 years, and we know now that, that addictive foods are truly physiologically addictive. We can watch it in, on brain scans, Judy. Like I can like point to a brain scan and show you how the nucleus accumbens has as much dopamine downregulation in someone with uh, obesity and food addiction as the, as the brain of someone with heroin or cocaine addiction. Like their nucleus of their addictive centers are shot. Like they can't produce natural dopamine hardly at all anymore. They need to get sugar and flour every right. cup, every, every couple hours, just to not be crawling out of their skin, their brains are shot. And so we know that. And so feeding them those foods in a treatment environment is ludicrous. It's ludicrous. But once they've sort of dug in their heels on no food rules, eliminating sugar and flour sounds counterproductive, right. restrictive, right? Crazy making unsustainable. And it's like, well, it's no more unsustainable than quitting smoking if you're hooked on smoking, right? Like, do you have to eat to live? Yes. Do you have to eat donuts to live? No, actually, you don't. I eat all whole real foods. Like, think about that. I eat all whole real foods, every one, every fruit, every vegetable, every meat, every shellfish, every dairy, every grain, every legume. I eat all whole real foods. So tell me how I'm being restrictive. And in probably bigger quantities than you, thank you very much, right. or whoever out there in the eating disorder facility, right? So we've gone, our thinking about food has gone so cockeyed, it's ridiculous. But I'm with you. I wish they would they would start to get a clue in the eating disorders world as well. And I think Dr. Joy Jacobs and some other people are on the vanguard, like really, I've got not one, not two, but three textbooks, college level textbooks on my shelf back there on food addiction, right? So when people say, oh, there's no research, it's like, are you kidding me? There's now hundreds and thousands of published studies. There's plenty of research. Yeah. And I hope that these facilities start making changes because the other thing, the other bit that I forgot to mention that they add is they add a lot of psychiatric drugs to try to balance the mood imbalances. Right. So they, right. most people in there will take <laughs> yeah. anti-anxiety meds and antidepressants and then other meds with that. And, and by the way, I do know people who used to have really bad eating disorders who didn't have food addiction, who had an eating disorder, say bulimia, right. Who now can eat a little bit of a cupcake if they want. Right. And I know someone who 
came from that background and tried to do bright line eating and it, it made her crazy. It didn't work for her at all. Right. So everybody's different, right? Everybody's different. Bright line eating is not for everybody, but we do know that these foods, these processed foods absolutely are physiologically addictive and making people, and they're not healthy either. Right. Like, let's all just be really clear about that. Like, you know, everyone can live without eating cupcakes. So, I mean, not everyone has to live without eating cupcakes, but certainly it's not, it's not a health food that should be forced on people in a, in a clinical setting like that. That's, that's not helpful. So yeah, yeah and to just add to your account, um, I, I struggled with bulimia and eating disorders, but I think it started with binging, um, not having enough proper nutrients. So the body desired, you know, whatever will make Judy go and get some food or more food. Um, and so then I would end up binging at night and then I would end up, well, I don't want to gain weight on this diet. So then I'd end up purging. And um, I thought I would never get over it. I thought forever I'm doomed with this disease. And eating a more whole foods diet has allowed me to no longer struggle with that. Sure. There are moments where when I'm stressed, um, I may, my inclination is, Oh, I'm going to go get a snack. But I know now that like, because I'm self-aware now, um, I don't do that. And so maybe I'll go snuggle with my kids or something to kind of break the monotony of work. Um, and I don't turn to food as much. And so now, like you were saying, as I've been healing, as I'm more aware, if I want to dabble in vegetables and even something that's lightly sweet, I can, but I know my boundaries in a sense, but it took me to heal first and be aware to even go back. So, I mean, I too, am a testament that I have, I no longer have an eating disorder and I absolutely don't binge, but sure. There's like moments where I'm, you know, that moment of stress where I'm like, Oh, I want to go down and grab a, grab a snack. And that's like maybe my last thing, but yeah. And that, that sounds like a beautiful incorporation of what I call the resume reframe, which is the sine wave of, you know, life ebbs and flows. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're riding high on the wave and it's just, it's easy. And we're hardly thinking about food at all. And other times we're dipping really low and of course, we're going to think about eating at those times. And then our reserves get tested. And what are the other tools in our tool belt? And, you know, and mainly it's just understanding when you're on the downslope and not doing things at that time so that you slide all the way down and crash right. and burn and just back to binging your brains out or whatever your, you know, least helpful behaviors around food are, right? So you just, you know, you just got to pull yourself back up at that time. And sometimes it does get a little bit wonkier, you know, but I'm like you, I can, I now, you know, I follow my bright lines and I know sort of within my own ebbs and flows, you know, where my stretch zones are. And there are some even within bright line eating, you know, and I talk about that a little bit, some specifics, for example, in the book resume, you know, where can you stretch without mm-hmm. breaking, you know, but life goes on, it has to be livable. I mean, I travel around the world, I eat in any restaurant, I can get a bright meal at an airport and at four in the morning, you know, like I, I eat at any restaurant, anytime, anywhere, there's if it's really, really not meal time for me, I just won't eat, you know, or if I just ate, I won't eat a second meal right away. But you know, basically I live, I live in the world. It's very doable. And, and yeah, recovery is possible. Like you can completely heal to the point where you just don't, not only do not have the the symptoms, the excess weight, the right. obsession about food, but you can be better off than you were before you ever started because of all of the beautiful people you meet and all the skills that you learn and all the self-awareness. I mean, food is, um, Food is a brutal master, but it's an incredible teacher too. And it's, it's a good yardstick about like, how am I really doing? And uh, those of us for whom food is sort of the keystone habit, it's the one that we've got to get right right or everything else kind of falls apart, you know, because of how much we have to eat and how often and how much it's focused on in our society, it can be a real gift for those of us who are inclined toward being our best selves. You know, food is an incredible teacher. I, I, I love that. And I have to agree with you as we're wrapping up, uh, if people want to get started, you know, like they've been through every diet, um, they, maybe they still use some of the sweeteners and they're trying to stay off of sugar and white bread. Yeah, absolutely. The bright line eating membership is so affordable. So afford it's 20 bucks a month. It's the best deal in weight loss, I swear. Um, and so just go to brightlineeating.com, B R I G H T L I N E. And then eating E A T I N G brightlineeating.com. Um, and just get started, give it a try. Like just, you know, what do you got to lose except right. your, your hunger, your cravings and a bunch of weight. It's like, yeah, the research shows it's really effective. So just give it a try. And um, where else can they follow your content? Oh, everywhere. You know, whatever their favorite social is, whatever, Facebook, uh, Instagram, 
I guess the Twitter, I don't, I don't tweet much. <laughs> I don't, I don't Instagram much, but uh, I'm there. And yeah, and three books, you know, I'm a New York Times bestselling author, the, the books have sold really, really well, and people are loving them. And so you can get my books at Barnes and Noble or Amazon or anywhere they sell books, pretty much. Yeah. And I'll put all the information in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining me today. This was such a wonderful conversation. And I love that you're not just sharing studies and information that you've learned through all of your years in academia, but you have struggled with this. And that, um, you know, just firsthand what it is to be addicted to drugs or foods and how you can heal and how this is your mission because of all your healing yourself. Thanks so much, Judy. It's been a real treat to talk with you. Thanks for all you're doing. Okay, guys, I hope that this interview was another lever to get you to root cause healing. If you're not sure if you have a food addiction or struggle with an imbalanced relationship with food, I highly suggest taking the test on Dr. Susan Thompson's site. Um, I will put that in the show notes. It's only 10 questions, but it allows you to figure out, do you have an imbalanced relationship with food or tendencies for food addiction? For me, a carnivore a meat only diet was truly healing of my eating disorder and my binge tendencies and restrictive tendencies. So make sure to check that out. If you are struggling with food addiction, meat only is not the only solution. You can always open up to other foods over time. It's up to you really and figuring out what makes sense in your own life. For Dr. Susan Thompson, eating a variety of whole foods was the answer to help her overcome and now she's thriving. So for her, it makes sense the way she's eating. I hope you can figure out what makes you heal instead of long-term going through bouts of diets and cycles of eating and then restricting and then binging and then eating off plan. Like the long term is what you find that is consistent for your way of eating. And that will bring you happiness and peace in the long term. That doesn't mean that it's always meat only. It doesn't mean it's carnivore. It could be paleo. It could be other things, but you just have to figure out what will allow you to bring, be more consistent. For me, it's pretty much meat based. It's like 95 to 98% meat. And that really makes me thrive. So sure. I can add some veggies, but I know my performance isn't as well. And that's just my own N equals one. But for some of my clients, it's adding back other things. Some people it's just staying zero carb meat only for the rest of their lives. You have to figure that out for yourself. But I hope that this conversation really helps you to focus on the why as to why we turn to certain foods and why they may not necessarily be good for us. While you're here, please make sure to like and subscribe. If you enjoyed this, please leave a review on podcasts as this helps my content get in front of more people. So thank you for that. Make sure to eat a lot of meat, take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you later. Bye guys.